Life can be messy. It can be busy and hectic and non-stop, filled with drama and tinged with tragedy over the course of even the best of our years. Life, Douglas Adams once mused, is wasted on the living. So, at the end of our long days, as we try to forget about the hustle and bustle waiting just outside our front doors, it feels strange that we often turn to media that is just as dramatic and unpredictable and violent as the world we're trying to escape. In Japan, a society that's far more demanding of its people, whose work versus play dynamic is skewed even further towards the former than our own, they understand the need to truly unwind through the media they consume, to detach from their own reality, to heal. I've spoken before about Iyashike, a subgenre of Japanese media that sets out to emotionally soothe its audience, to impart a sense of calm we all struggle to find in our ordinary lives. It's audiovisual soul food, mellow movies and TV shows that avoid drama and action in favour of presenting a more relaxed, more grounded and, ultimately, more heartwarming experience. Slice of Life anime is a genre that understands the importance of such media and frequently champions the ashike, the day-to-day -day lives of its numerous protagonists and their significantly lowered stakes compared to their more mainstream counterparts at least, lends these shows an ebb and flow of emotional investment and payoff that can't be found elsewhere in the medium. Through a variety of settings and characters, it finds in each of them a steady, comforting pulse. Slice of Life allows its characters, and consequently anime as an art form, to breathe, and to lean into moments that other shows simply wouldn't have the time for. Our favourite characters are afforded extended opportunities to be funny, or happy, or to truly achieve something worth achieving. They're free to explore romance and friendship with the amount of depth and nuance such relationships demand. These people grow as we watch them, and as we find out who they truly are, they do too. But whilst its shows are more relaxed, however, they're by no means perpetually upbeat or tiringly saccharine. For as warm and fuzzy as themes of coming of age and personal growth are, they usually come with plenty of heartbreak and pain to make the successes of the genre count in a way that feels genuine and earned. Slice of Life understands that life can be messy, but it also understands that life is just a series of moments, some of which are heart-wrenchingly cruel, others wonderfully warm. It minds these snapshots of life in an effort to take us out of our own moments, to explore a life far safer to invest in than our own. It's escapism, pure and concentrated. It's not for everyone, but maybe it's for you. Today on Beyond Ghibli, I'll be exploring some of my favourite anime getaways and speaking about what makes them so special. Ten years before Shirabako showed us how anime was made, Genshiken showed us how anime was watched, how it was dissected and loved and critiqued and consumed completely by those who adored anime as much as we do. When I first discovered it in 2004, it felt like a life raft. I'd been watching anime for a couple of years by then before stumbling upon this strange show that had seemingly come out of nowhere, wildly different from the fantastical stuff I'd been watching previously. As I watched that first episode, I found myself elated. Here was a group of people, weird and flawed enough to be completely believable, who were having conversations about fictional runs of adapted anime and the power of video games, speaking about voice actors and directorial debuts and whether or not a pornographic spin-off captured the essence of the characters it was defiling. These were conversations I was desperate to be having, but could rarely find anyone who'd ventured further than Studio Ghibli if they'd ever even heard of them. It seems strange in 2018 to think of Ghibli as anything but ubiquitous, 
but not even two decades ago, anime was still a dirty little secret, a strange, nerdy hobby that only the geekiest of geeks went for. And here, on my television screen, were the geekiest of even the Japanese geeks, dissecting shows and arguing about best girls and doing so all in their humble little after-school meeting room, with squeaky chairs and walls stacked with manga and figurines. And there were girls in the club too, girls just as flawed and imperfect as their male counterparts, who liked anime and manga and porn as much as they did. Genjiken was hugely important for me as a budding anime fan. It gave me a community where in real life I had none. It gave me a hard smack of reality, where the rest of anime was threatening to whisk me away into a fever dream of big eyes and colourful hairstyles. It helped me sit back and see anime for what it was, both the good and the bad, and put things into perspective that previously I hadn't been able to make out through the sexy jutsu ninjas and beautiful robots. The beauty of Genshiken is in its cast, a varied group of nerds and normies who are easy to relate to. I saw parts of myself in each of them, and I remember feeling any anxiety about my passions and perversions slipping away as I watched that first season. Ultimately, Genshiken feels like camaraderie, and champions the need for community regardless of what our passion is. What Genshiken offered that no other show came close to fulfilling was acceptance. A mantra that's repeated throughout the show is, embarrassment will get you nowhere. The newcomer, Sasahara, is a budding geek who hasn't quite accepted who he is yet, but is welcomed into this otaku group with open arms, and all of his own insecurities about who he is and what he likes are put to rest. And in doing so, the show offers the same thing to its viewers. As a 14-year-old, who also looked up the skirts of figurines to make sure that underwear was properly rendered, read doujinji of my favourite anime characters to see them in uncharacteristically compromising positions, and desperately wanting to play Eroge, but having to settle for the Love Hina dating game on Newgrounds instead. To see guys obsessing over the same perversions, and not only obsessing over them, but supporting each other in the pursuit of them, was mind-blowing to me. Whilst we're introduced to the group through Sasahara, the main character undoubtedly becomes the fantastic Saki, a long-suffering girlfriend of the deceptively nerdy pretty boy Kosaka. As she's unwillingly dragged to events and hangouts she has absolutely zero interest in, with a group she initially finds despicable, she inadvertently begins to build a relationship with not just the group, but the passion they all share. Her descent into the culture of otaku is always reluctant. Indeed, she goes kicking and screaming brilliantly into that abyss. But as she does, she begins to feel defensive of the group, and begins, despite her best intentions, to love them all. And through her, any troubled anime fans can kind of love themselves. Genshiken is a message of hope, yeah, you like weird stuff, and yes, that makes you weird. That's not what the show challenges. Instead, it challenges the concept of weird, and asks whether there's really anything wrong with it to begin with. Much like Genshiken, my next pick focuses on an after-school club to tell a story of growing up and discovering yourself. Slice of Life often zeroes in on school days, because without the extraordinary circumstances we're accustomed to in anime, forcing our leads to evolve in either power or maturity, the formative nature of this down-to-earth experience is where most of us find out who we truly are, and transition into adulthood naturally, albeit with some serious growing pains. These pains along with their confusion and angst and even joy, are explored beautifully in Tatsuya Ishihara's phenomenal series Sound Euphonium. Ishihara was no stranger to directing seminal anime by the time he got around to adapting this popular series of novels by Ayano Takeda. Indeed, his portfolio reads like a greatest hits of the anime I grew up watching and loving. Having made his debut at Kyoto Animation with Air in 2005, Ishihara went on to direct series such as the heartbreakingly beautiful Clanad, the absolutely hilarious Nichijo, 
and the cultural touchstone that was the melancholy of Suzumiya Haruhi. Kyoani had actually tackled a slice of life series about an after school music club six years earlier with the wildly popular K On, directed by the incredibly talented Naoko Yamada. What's fascinating about this is just how different K On and Sound Youth ended up being, despite their familiar themes and even surprisingly similar character designs. Where K On is a raucous, funny, high energy rock come tea time show that traded in Moe, or the art of cute girls being cute. Sound Youth told a down-to-earth, touching tale of a young girl in her high school band finding out, quietly, who she is. I adored k when I first watched it, and remain a fan to this day, but I felt truly changed when I finished Sound Euphonium's first season. This is down in no small part to the masterful, subtle evolution of Sound Youth's two leads, Kumiko and Reina. Kumiko, whose passion for musical performance is waning, begrudgingly joins her new school's band out of a strange sense of duty, only to find an old friend Reina trying out as well. Reina, whose fearsome talent and relentless drive intimidates and upsets everyone around her, has found herself a bit of a social pariah. This juxtaposition in character is what ultimately drove these two apart, but as Kumiko rediscovers her old friend in a new light, passions are stirred. If that sounded vaguely euphemistic, it's because Sound Euphonium trades in such ambiguity in a wonderfully realistic but painful way. Critics have slammed the show for queer baiting, pointing at the eternally confusing will they won't they relationship between Reina and Kumiko as something underhanded or non committal. But the thing is, in such a tumultuous time in anyone's life, at an intersection of puberty and passion and ambition, with the terror of making new friends and the comfort of old ones, with the scary unknowns of physicality and love opening their doors to you, where the next recital or concert or relationship feels crushingly final, like you may never get a shot again if you screw this up, there's bound to be confusion. That's what I love about Sound Youth. It captures that adolescent confusion perfectly. Its leads stumble through their emotions, say things they shouldn't, hurt their friends, and misunderstand each other and themselves. And through all of these struggles and miscommunications, we get to see two people truly grow. Whilst the power of Reina's character is pure spectacle, we're as in awe of her as Kumiko is, we're in safe hands with the latter as our lead. She's a blast to watch, and feels scarily real compared to her contemporaries. Unlike Kaon, or the countless shows that present teenage girls as giddy and bubbly and melodramatic, Sound Youth gives us a relatable, level-headed teenage lead for the first time in what feels like forever, by its end, Sound Euphonium feels anything but stereotypical. Watching these girls felt like the end of an era to me. An era that dutifully carried on, it turns out, as soon as the credits rolled. But still, the joy of watching countless tropes and trends that Kyo Annie themselves have helped institutionalise get bucked so flagrantly, and so effortlessly, lent the show a heart I haven't found elsewhere since. When I heard that mangaka Himoru Arakawa of Full Metal Alchemist fame would be turning her talents to a manga about farming, I was confused. I was even more confused, however, when I watched its anime adaptation and discovered one of my favourite shows. Silver Spoon, or Gin no Saji, is the tale of a young, directionless man named Hachiken enrolling in an agricultural boarding school for complicated reasons. Hachiken has about as much interest in farming and animal husbandry as most of its viewers likely have which is to say, none. And he immediately begins acting like a surrogate for the audience. Through Hachiken's naivete and ignorance, we too begin learning about the multitude of professions that make up Japan's agricultural world, and its scope is immediately impressive. Over the course of its unassuming opening episodes, I found myself absolutely enraptured by the mechanics of farming and the strength of the people who pursue it. Silver Spoon is, of course, a work of fiction, but it's a fiction grounded in an unforgiving reality. 
The show relishes in silly gags, slapstick humour and goofy visuals, but beneath this enjoyable front is a show that demands exploration. Silver Spoon doesn't shy away from the grisly realities of farm life, and Hachiken's difficult relationship with the industry mirrors our own. Farming is a fickle business, crops can die off unexpectedly, bad weather can ruin months of hard work, and a farmer's relationship with his livestock is a complicated one. Silver Spoon succeeds because it doesn't sugarcoat those harsh truths. In fact, it explores this very relationship, and its bittersweet beats become the heart of the show. Like the best slice of life, Silver Spoon allows these themes room to grow. One of the best topics discussed throughout the show is the ethics behind meat consumption. Hachiken comes in contact with plenty of his meals when they're still walking around the farmyard. Indeed, he's tasked with caring for, and consequently loving, a variety of animals that end up in his belly. This scene in the credit sequence seems gauche and inappropriately morbid when you first see it. Hachiken surrounded by food and the ghosts of the animals it took to make that feast. But as I made my way through the season and saw that scene over and over again, it became hugely important, integral even, to the spirit of Silver Spoon. The anime doesn't try to convert its viewers to vegetarianism or to eat meat, though all the food on display throughout the season sure looks tasty. All Silver Spoon wants is for us to be honest with ourselves, to not take anything for granted, and to give the attention and thought to an industry we often like to forget about, simply because it's easier for us to enjoy our next meal. By the end of this two-season masterpiece, I felt like I'd learned a whole lot. Not just about farming, but about myself. This introspection simply can't be found in many mediums. And yet I dwelled on Silver Spoon's moral, self-questioning themes for months after the final credits had rolled. Slice of Life is escapism at its finest, despite being grounded in reality. Whether it's showing us life as an otaku, a musician, or even a farmer, it provides a holiday away from our own lives, and a look behind the curtain at the lives of others. It can be beautiful and happy, or sad and cruel, but often it's a mixture of every emotion that makes up our time on this planet. It is, as the name implies, a vertical slice of existence, not necessarily at its most interesting, but often at its most human. In the best the genre has to offer, these glimpses not only allow us to explore someone else's reality, but further understand our own, to look inside ourselves by watching others, and understand a little more deeply what makes us tick. As always, thanks for watching. Apologies for the delay between releases. This was the longest video I've done in a little while, and as such it was a bit of a beast to angle. It marks my first real foray into recommending TV anime, and I hope you dug it. Patrick provided two tracks for this one, which is great because I'm rubbish at talking about music, and even worse when requesting the stuff. So he did a fantastic job with the simple brief of warm and plinky plonky. A huge thank you to my patrons who have been very patient with me this month, and a big shout out to all the new ones who hopped aboard since the last video. If you're interested in hearing me badmouth beautiful movies, head over and pledge a buck to join our increasingly active Discord server and get a whole heap of cool rewards. If you think I've missed a trick by not making Goblin Slayer my first TV recommendation, hit the like button and I'll probably still not watch it. What's it even about?